Professor Sir Peter Ratcliffe. You are the director of, the, of clinical research at the Francis Crick Institute in London. Indeed. You are also the director of Target Discovery Institute at the University of Oxford. Yes, that's true. And you are a fellow of the Royal Society in London. Um, in 2019, you were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine uh, for the work you have done in understanding cellular oxygen sensing. So congratulations on that one. And thank you very much. Thank you for being here. It's an honor. How are you today? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. What is your idea of perfect happiness? I don't think there can be perfect happiness. And the reason I say that, I think, well, you be aware of the seasons. So Singapore has no seasons. It's mm, true. warm, it's beautiful, but after a while it becomes tedious. Mm -hmm. And most Singaporeans will travel to see other places. Mm -hmm. I think the same is true of human emotion. There can be no happiness without sadness and no sadness, fortunately, without happiness. So actually, I think what is important is the acceleration between sadness and happiness. I think there's some sort of biological basis for that, that when the brain is sad, it will make the happiness chemicals. And when you're happy, sadly, they'll make the sadness chemicals. Mm -hmm. So of course, the best bits are the acceleration out of sadness to happiness. But I couldn't say what was perfection in that. It's simply, I think, a matter of gradient. Mm -hmm. And I think that's biological. By I me, mean, I think it's neurological. What do you most value in your friends? I love humour. I think a good friend makes you feel valued. That may not actually, that yeah. may just be a learned human behaviour. Mm -hmm. But a good companion enhances your confidence. What is the craziest thing you have ever done? Well, I couldn't possibly tell you. Uh, I tried to race, I tried to race go-karts, uh, not go-karts, carts. And that was a slightly crazy thing. It was outside mm -hmm. the usual yes. field of mm -hmm. my stratosphere. I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> fortunately, we survived. <clears throat> yes, fortunately. What do you consider the most overrated virtue? I've just given you that power. I, I don't think, well, I suppose some people have to be in charge of others, but uh, there's a class of person, actually it's common. It's common in the spheres that we operate in. It's commoner in men than women, and that's a defect to want to control. I know people who want to control people, not because there's any <clears throat> personal real personal reward for that, but they just want to do it. Mm -hmm. And you see that now in, in political figures. I, I could be Julius Caesar. That wouldn't worry me. I'm in charge of everything I want. If I want wealth, I have it. Everyone will obey me. I, I don't have to appear in public. I don't have to give answers to the press. I can have every conceivable human desire given to me. I, I, I could see why you would be Julius Caesar. I, I cannot see why you would be the president of the United States of America. I, but people want to do it, despite the fact that it is the most horrendously difficult job. And you have to appear in 
in public and you have no peace, you have no personal life, you have no private life. Mm -hmm. Why do they want to do it? Why do they want to do it? Because they have a drive to control other human beings. I don't think I have that drive, but, but that is a really odd thing that the people will do, and I've seen it in the university system. They don't know what they're going to do when they control people but they want to control them. Mm. Commoner in men than women, of course, I'm a man, so mm. I see that. But I, 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 don't, uh, I don't value that, I don't respect it, and at least to an extent, I don't have it myself. What would you like to understand better? In science? In anything. Well, again, I'll give you two examples. I, 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 I'd like to understand the origin of life. So Darwin has explained the evolution of the species. That's, that's what he said, the origin of the species. But I, I still don't think we understand the, the origin of life. I'd like to understand that. Um, economics is fascinating the means of driving cooperative human behavior. I can't predict that. I don't know why nowadays we're printing money. We're printing money like crazy. I don't think there's going to be inflation. Previously there was. Why, why, why is this? I, I think I quite like to understand these principles. They're cooperative human behavior. And that's more difficult to judge than personal behavior because one individual leads the others. It's much less predictable. I'd like to understand that. When and where were you happiest? I can't really understand that one or answer it um, because they're the accelerations from sadness to happiness. So. I won't go into the detail, but like everyone else, we've had some sadnesses. But it's the coming out of those sadnesses, I think, was, mm. was a very interesting thing. That actually life wasn't as bad as you thought, the blow that you'd had. Mm. I guess you have it with a grant application or a rejected paper. A scientist has more ups and downs mm. True. than... It's not true that, that, that science is the happiest thing in my life, there are other things. Uh, but the principle is there and you can explain it perhaps more accurately uh, through that experience. That actually the rejected paper, it's not as bad as all that, it will get... And anyway, it's true and that was the satisfaction of it, not the publication of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Or that, you know, some other thing has failed, some experimental result. I suppose, you know, for a scientist, some of those experimental results, the very few that did work, mm -hmm. they're absolutely brilliant. If you could change one thing in yourself, what would that be? There's lots of things I'd like to change in myself. Anxiety. I think that... Um, <clears throat> I'm not making any personal confession here, but there are a number of defects in human beings in general in relation to the world we live in. Those defects, are, I'm a biologist, as, as you know, so I see things through Darwinian evolution. So what have we got that we don't need or is counterproductive to the way we should be as, as human beings now? They're first of all anxiety that uh, we're evolved to live in a dangerous society. As, as you probably know, uh, most of the archeological remains of deceased people mm. 4,000 years ago, whatever, mm. they died a violent death. There's an arrow through the chest. There's an arrow, you know, something in the skull. So of course life was very dangerous. The whole business was men killed each other in order to command the territory. So we all have an anxiety, a mistrust of other human beings, which is redundant to the way in which we exist. 
and I think probably well more trusting of most human beings. What do you think is the closest thing to real magic? I don't know what real magic is, you tell me. What is real magic? You mean things that don't obey physical laws? I don't know, we talked before about the origin of life. Is that real? I mean, there's something we don't understand there. But broadly, I don't think there is magic. I, I, I think it's all... Uh, I was brought up in the north of England, in, in, in Morecambe, Lancashire. Um, it's a holiday resort, not, not a very sophisticated one. Uh, we would go and see, um, or people would not meet, Gypsy Sarah. Gypsy Sarah would tell you a fortune. And sort of rather accurately, so who was Gypsy Sarah? She was probably an enormously perspective human being. Human beings are extremely good at understanding other human beings. From the pause you make in this conversation to milliseconds, I can understand whether you agree with me, you doubt me, you respect me, you disrespect me. So that almost is the closest thing to magic, Gypsy mm -hmm. Sarah. We thought she was magical, but she could assess you. Mm just in this conversation, tell your fortune. That's because with extreme subtlety, she could observe your movements and make deductions, which were more accurate than you might think. I think that's close to magic. What is the one message you would give to your 20 year old self? Be less anxious, I've told you. I've been inhibited through, I don't know, I, uh, yeah, be more, be less anxious, don't worry too much about things. Although young people don't worry, you know, they, they choose their careers without too much, too much worry. I, 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 I've told you, I've told other people anyway, how I chose to do, to medicine, you know the story? I wanted to be a chemist, industrial chemist. That's, that's because I was quite good at chemistry. And um, my parents said, uh, a distant relative, I never knew him, he'd been a successful chemist who worked on Brufen, the pharmaceutical. And uh, the headmaster came into the chemistry lab one day, he said, uh, Radcliffe, have a word. So, so, guy that wore a gown. I followed him to his study and he said, Radcliffe, I, I think you should do medicine. He, he wasn't the sort of guy you challenge. So I said, yes sir. We struck out chemistry, we put out medicine on, on the... So, you know, young people make decisions that sort of way. Maybe I might have thought about things a little bit more carefully than I did. Thank you. Okay, thank you.